No hair, I've thrown my ponytail with no hair. Nothing. A little while later, I'll stay in bed. Tonight, a Saskatchewan man tells APTN News about waking up in a hospital with his hair cut. The Senate unanimously supports a bill to end forced sterilization of Indigenous women. She usually comes back to camp and just waits for them there. But she, at this point, she didn't come back. And the bizarre story of a missing dog from Yukon and how it ended up in another country. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Hair has significant cultural importance for Indigenous peoples around the world. In Saskatchewan, an elder who lost consciousness due to a medical emergency woke up in the hospital and discovered that his ponytail was gone. Video journalist Rachel May interviewed the elder who says he experienced more than just physical trauma. Did I blacked out? And I remember they put me in a, in a stretcher and it wheeled me down the steps. And uh, I was swearing all the way because they were hurting me, hurting me, hurting me. The week of August 30th, 73-year-old Reuben St. Charles fell at home in Saskatoon and broke his hip. His wife called an ambulance and he was taken to the Royal University Hospital. Reuben lost consciousness in the ambulance. He didn't wake up until his hip was replaced. That is when he noticed his hair was cut. No hair, I felt my ponytail, no hair, nothing. A little while later, I was laying in bed and none of the nurses come in there. They funny when they did come in there, I said, what happened to my hair, I says. Uh, we'll tell you later or something like that. Before the replacement, Reuben says he had a small ponytail that took years to grow. It was intended to be cut only if he lost his sister. When he asked some nurses what happened to his hair, Reuben says he didn't get answers, but did hear laughter. I heard these nurses laughing. I don't know if it's the same too, but I heard them laughing, saying, well, at least he's got the start of a mohawk cut. He was transferred from Royal University Hospital to City Hospital around September 5th. He called the Métis Nation Saskatchewan for help. That's when MNS patient advocate Bonnie Marwood entered the picture. When I first got to know him, he was uh, doing quite a bit of cursing and, and he was upset and rightfully so. Um, but since then, we've had lots of talks, and um, he's got some real life experiences, and, and he's got a wealth of knowledge, and he's our elder, and I enjoy talking with him. Reuben deserves to know who hurt him. St. Charles and Marwood have searched for answers without luck. They still aren't sure about what happened. The Saskatchewan Health Authority emailed APTN a statement. It says, in part, we acknowledge the deep cultural significance of hair and braids in First Nations and Métis cultures and recognize that cutting hair without permission can cause emotional and spiritual harm, evoking past cultural trauma. It goes on to say the SHA extends its deepest apologies for this individual's experience and we remain committed to engaging with this patient to understand and learn from this experience. The investigation into why Reuben St. Charles's hair was cut is ongoing. The SHA says they will let him know the outcome once it's complete. St. Charles is home now, and despite his experience at Royal University, he thanked the nurses at City Hospital who took the time to get to know him. Rachel May, ABTN National News, Saskatoon. To Ottawa, where the Canadian Senate has unanimously supported a bill to end the forced sterilization of Indigenous women in this country. This comes as numerous class, a class action lawsuits for forced sterilization are going through the courts with victims from numerous provinces and territories seeking compensation. Last week, victims and advocates presented to the Senate where private members bill S-250 passed third reading. The bill will tighten existing legislation and make forced and coerced sterilization an indictable offense with a sentence of up to 14 years in prison. According to Senator Yvonne Boyer, who has spearheaded the bill, more than 12,000 women, mostly Indigenous, were sterilized in the last 100 years in Canada. 
Victims who spoke to the Senate called for accountability and said forced and coerced sterilization against them is an act of genocide. The bill will now go to the House of Commons with victims hoping it will be passed before the upcoming election. And while the CMA is taking important steps to address this, amongst many other issues, there needs to be a swift and serious legislative action as well. It is incumbent on us as the current occupants of these seats to send a clear message that forced sterilization of any sort is unacceptable and will no longer be tolerated. Yukon's chief coroner is investigating a string of recent drug overdose deaths. The Yukon Coroner Service says it's been investigating six deaths since August 6th, four of which occurred between September 23rd and October 4th. The service is also investigating two more suspe suspected drug deaths during the same 11-day period. Of the four confirmed cases, all occurred in Whitehorse and involved cocaine. Three of the confirmed deaths involved fentanyl. The service says the deaths do not appear to be linked, suggesting that toxic substances are circulating in Whitehorse. Since January of this year, there have been 12 confirmed substance use related deaths. A former Winnipeg educator who facilitated Indigenous programming at multiple schools is facing several charges related to child sexual exploitation. 37-year-old Matthew James Musso was arrested on October 2nd and later released under a release order. On Saturday, a petition was launched calling for Musso to be placed under police custody during the investigation to protect survivors. Sierra Bettens has that story. Earlier this month, the Winnipeg Police Service arrested 37-year-old Matthew James Musso for five offenses, possession of child pornography, accessing child pornography, voyeurism, sexual assault, and sexual exploitation. In July 2024, the WPS's Internet Child Exploitation Unit, or ICE, was notified of child sexual abuse imagery on Musso's cell phone. They later found video recordings from April 2023 and May 2024 of children and adults undressing at the Seven Oaks Pool in Winnipeg. Prior to his arrest, Musso was an educator and Indigenous way of life teacher within the Winnipeg School Division until resigning in May 2024. In a statement sent to EBTN, Winnipeg School Division Superintendent Matt Henderson said division officials were made aware of an alleged inappropriate relationship between Musso and a student in May 2024. They immediately contacted the police and the Child and Family All Nations Coordinated Response Network. Publicly viewable documents suggest that Musso was also employed at the Seven Oaks School Division as an educational assistant. The Seven Oaks School Division did not provide a statement nor confirm Musso's employment. Musso was also a volunteer at Rossbrook House. Rossbrook House Communications and Marketing Manager Sherry Rasmussen told APTN that Musso was involved with the organization through the Winnipeg School Division and led a drum program in 2023. After his arrest, Musso was released on a release order. However, on Saturday, a petition calling for Musso's return to police custody during the investigation was launched. It currently has over 100 signatures. The WPS says anyone with information can contact investigators at 204-986-6172. Sierra Bettens, EPTN National News, Winnipeg. Time to step aside for a quick break. Still to come, the story of a missing dog found thousands of kilometers away from home. Dogs are a human's best friend, you know, but this is more than that. You know, they're family. Welcome back. Hundreds of chiefs from across Canada will begin meeting in Calgary tomorrow to discuss a $47.8 billion child welfare reform agreement. Resolutions are on the table to approve the deal, delay it, renegotiate it or reject it outright. 
The Chilcotin National Government in British Columbia is urging chiefs across the country to vote against the proposed settlement. Among the concerns, the certainty of uncertainty of fiscal commitments, how funding allocations and decisions are made, and who makes those decisions. Tribal Chair Joe Alphonse says AFN National Chief Cindy Woodhouse Nipanak is not showing or is showing a lack of leadership. We don't support the um, the agreement. Um, I think it's a good opportunity to 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 work together as um, as First Nations people across this country. And I think that's seeing the way it's negotiated. Um, we don't feel like we've been included in that negotiation, and and uh, I think that's disrespectful. I also feel, you know. Um, Cindy Blackstock has been a big part of uh, this. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. And she she fought for this uh, when no one else will. And I think it's very disrespectful to, to not include her. And I think, you know, that stems right from the very top. You can watch that entire interview with Chief Alphonse on Thursday on Nation to Nation. APTN News is at the Special Chiefs Assembly and we'll have plenty of coverage. We'll also be streaming the event on our website, aptnnews.ca, and on our APTN News YouTube page beginning tomorrow morning. Well, we'd also like to hear what you think about the proposed $47 billion child welfare reform settlement or anything else you'd like to get in touch about. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, you can send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, you can go to our website, aptnnews.ca. You can also find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs, or UBCIC, says Canada continues to discriminate against First Nations women and children on the basis of sex, race, and family status. And it blames the Indian Act, saying that for 148 years it was used as an effective tool of forced assimilation. UBCIC and Hailsuk Chief Councillor Marilyn Slett along with a number of Indigenous women's groups traveled to Geneva, Switzerland this past weekend, where they presented their research on the matter to the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. The UBCIC says between 1876 and 1985, the Indian Act legally defined thousands of First Nations women and their children as non-Indian if the women married uh, non-First Nations men. Yet First Nations men could pass status to non-First Nations wives and their children. The groups call it a sexist legislative scheme that has brought racism, misogyny and violence to Indigenous women for generations. They call it the root cause to the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls crisis in Canada. The group wants Canada to end sex discrimination and repeal the rules regarding transmission of Indian status. They also want compensation and restored membership for all victims. Turning to a bizarre story now out of the Yukon about a missing dog from a First Nation. While the dog has since been returned, its owner has many questions about how the dog went missing and how it ended up being found thousands of kilometers away. Midnight belongs to this land. The five-year-old dog lives in Burwash Landing, two hours from the Alaskan border. Midnight and her owner, Kalani First Nation elder Alice Johnson, both love being outdoors. But a recent incident almost caused Midnight and Johnson to be separated from each other forever. And that's where she went missing. She tends to take off and chase deer. She loves to chase deer and she loves squirrels. Late last month, Johnson's family took Midnight to their camp at Duke River near Burwash while she was out of town. Midnight had wandered away, something she often does as a bush dog. But she usually comes back to camp and just waits for them there. But she, at this point, she didn't come back. 
Johnson says many in the community helped her in her quest to find midnight. But as the days went by, she assumed the worst. That was until she received a phone call from an animal hospital in Arizona. Midnight had been found almost 5,000 kilometers away. The word that has come, has come up continuously has been bizarre. As it turns out, American David Curlin was traveling through Alaska and had spotted Midnight wandering around the road without a collar. Curlin thought the dog was astray or abandoned, so he took her with him on his journey back to the States. He eventually took her to a vet in Kingman, Arizona, who discovered the dog was microchipped. He could have gone to the gas station and let her out there. You know, a dog on the highway doesn't necessarily mean that it's lost or abandoned. Johnson and Curlin were able to connect. She says Curlin told her he was happy to reunite her with her dog. Technically, that's not the case because you would have left the dog in Whitehorse at the nearby community and that's the responsibility of individuals who find dogs. Because I, After a long drive back from Arizona to the border, thanks to a pet taxi, Johnson and Midnight were reunited earlier this week. They're now both back in their beloved Burwash, where Johnson is helping reunite Midnight with the land. Uh, they say um, human, I mean, dogs are a human's best friend, you know, but this is more than that, you know, their family. I spoke with Curlin on the phone. He says it didn't occur to him at the time that the dog might have had an owner as she was found in a rural area. He says looking back, he probably should have done more to find out if she belonged to someone. Curlin realizes the situation was frustrating for Johnson and he's glad the story has a happy ending. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Crazy and story indeed. Glad they've at least been reunited now. Time for one last break here. Still to come, an Anishinaabe artist is looking to teach others. For me, the mural, specifically from an Indigenous context, is not just art for art's sake, but art for teaching and learning and growing. And also as an Indigenous artist, I want to take up space the way that we haven't been able to take up space before. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. With the fall season winding down, Shania Murdoch and her mother enjoyed a day at Assiniboine Park in Winnipeg, Manitoba, as the beautiful weather continues through October. Thanks for sharing, Shania. Let us know what your day looks like by sending a photo to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, showers and nine in Fredericton and Charlottetown. Seven in Cloudy and Kujuac, three in Nain. Eleven in Montreal, seven in Val d'Or. Eleven with showers in Sault Ste. Marie, nine in North Bay. Sun's out and 13 in Thunder Bay, 11 in Sioux Lookout. Eleven for God's Lake, 13 in Norway House. 15 in Winnipeg, 19 in Brandon and Dauphin, 24 in Regina, 22 in Saskatoon, 12 with showers in Meadow Lake, 10 and rain in Buffalo Narrows. In Northern Alberta, rain and 11 in high level, showers in 9 in Fort McMurray, 10 with rain in Edmonton, 19 and cloudy in Lethbridge, 15 with showers in Vancouver, Penticton and Victoria, rain and 7 in Prince George, snow and two in Deese Lake. Minus three with snow in Old Crow, four in Whitehorse. Six in Yellowknife, zero in Norman Wells. Minus three with snow in Saks Harbor, zero in Politeck. Snow and one in Chesterfield, cloudy and three in Baker Lake. Minus three with snow in Resolute, two below and snow in Arctic Bay. An Anishinaabe artist is bringing together her love for woodland style art and teaching to inspire others to explore their indigenous heritage. Lucia LaFord is also following in the footsteps of her father, who is well known in the world of woodland art. APTN's Mike McDonald reports. 
This mural is one of several public art displays in the city of Sault Ste. Marie designed by local artist Lucia LaFord. For the next several weeks, she will be walking this group of students from St. Mary's High School through the process of creating their own. For me, the mural, specifically from an Indigenous context, is not just art for art's sake, but art for teaching and learning and growing. And also as an Indigenous artist, I want to take up space the way that we haven't been able to take up space before. LaFord is the daughter of renowned woodland-style artist John LaFord, who passed away in 2021. Just before he passed, we were teaching together at the university, and he passed right in the middle of the course, and you just have this moment of, oh my gosh, the person that I learned everything from is gone. How am I going to continue teaching? And I never thought about that before, and then I realized, like, my father is still with me, and I believe in the Anishinaabek worldview that, you know, he's there with our ancestors, and so... I just, I then, I just keep teaching because I know that he loved teaching and he instilled that love of, of sharing everything that we love with everybody else. LaFord will be taking a break to work on another mural project at the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Southern Ontario. For this one, I'll be doing very something very similar, but going in, doing workshops on woodland style art, which also include cultural teaching. So I can't teach about woodland style art if I don't teach about who we are as Anishinaabek and as Indigenous people. So, you know, we'll be drumming, we'll be, we'll be smudging, we'll be talking about the medicines, we'll be talking about, you know, intergenerational healing, intergenerational trauma, because you have to talk about all those things. And while we're doing all that, we're going to be painting a mural as well. Asked why she chose to do a mural project at a prison, LaFord says she's had her own struggles. I've dealt with my own challenges of addiction, mental health, and other issues in my life. And so I know that being Indigenous means that we go through trauma, and that's. And I know that a lot of those women and people that are in there have gone through trauma, and that, that there's a reason why there's a more amount of us as Indigenous people in correctional facilities, and we're overrepresented in so many other things. Mike McDonald, ABTN National News, Sault Ste. Marie. The family of Morgan Harris have been clear that searching the Prairie Green Landfill just north of Winnipeg is just the beginning. And while the search for Harris and Mercedes Myron has yet to begin, there are calls to search the Brady Landfill next. In an encore presentation to Face to Face tonight, guest Melissa Robinson says she doesn't expect the same political fight when it comes to searching the Brady Landfill. I don't think we're going to need to fight as hard because um, I'm sure that once we start Prairie Green, there's going to be more, um, more found, we'll say, than what we're going in looking for. Um, and sitting at that table uh, in the legislative um, with the you know, uh, provincial government, they're well aware, too, that that very well could happen. Um, so I am certain that once we are done the Prairie Green, we will have no problems pushing forward with the Brady. You can catch that entire episode of Face to Face right here in less than two minutes time because we're all out of time for your Tuesday edition of your APTN National News. But Creason will be back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time with your first look at the day's news. And don't forget you can stream day one of the Assembly of First Nations Special Chiefs Assembly in Calgary beginning tomorrow morning around 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGuich. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.